Hi there, friends. This is Pastor Rivero from Liberty Baptist Church, and I'm excited to let you know that our church is now live streaming our services. So you can check it out on mylibertybaptist.org or on YouTube. Our services are at 11 a.m. on Sunday, 5 p.m. on Sunday, and 7 p.m. on Wednesday, all Eastern time. But in the meantime, enjoy this sermon podcast here from Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. Did I mention that we're in Revelation chapter number 10 this evening? Brother Vince, did I? All right, good. I want to check and make sure. Revelation chapter 10 is where we are. We're continuing to look at this issue about being time to eat. And we talked last week in this aside, this parentheses, remember, between the sixth and the seventh trumpet being blown, uh, that there's some things that are happening that are instructive to us and helpful for us. And although they may not necessarily move the timeline ahead, although they may not necessarily move the narrative ahead of what's happening as we approach this three and a half year mark in the tribulation, this halfway mark in the tribulation period, yet there's still some very important things for us to see in our text that are very helpful to us as John has to take this book. Remember, we talked about that last week, John taking this little book, but we see that he doesn't have to eat this book and why that's important and why it tastes the way it does and how that speaks to us Tonight, So we'll read all of Revelation chapter number 10 once again here this evening. And so let's go ahead and begin with verse number one where it says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book, which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. You know, it's interesting when we talk about food, and we mentioned last week at the beginning of the message about how instructive food choices can be, whether it's for special events or occasions or holidays or whatever they may be. We know the same can be said about foods as well as to how they taste. There's an importance to how food tastes. I mean, let's look at it this way. We like it when food tastes good. Amen. I mean, listen, this, this isn't hard, hard, complex stuff that we're starting with here tonight, folks. We like it when food tastes good. I mean, that's... Okay, good. Thank you. All right, that's good. We got a few of you. The rest of you, it's like, hey, no matter what I eat, that's fine. Well, I know who to invite over and who not to, all right? Or what to have when you come over, at the very least. Uh, the taste of food is typically very important to us. And, and we like, you know, we, we like those different flavors, don't we? Whether it's sweet or whether it's salty uh, or, or whether uh, it's something that might even be sour. Or we've been eating some sour foods for some strange reason during men's discipleship the last few weeks, trying to see who can uh, withstand the the onslaught of sour taste. We've been doing that in our men's uh, discipleship. And so we like those different kind of flavors. Our taste buds are made to be able to 
react to those different kinds of flavors. But many times the best foods are the foods with complex flavors. This is what I mean. Uh, I like chocolate chip cookies. Again, all God's children should say amen. I mean, a warm chocolate chip cookie, and some of you say, I haven't eaten dinner yet, Pastor. All right, I know, and I'm sorry, but a warm chocolate chip cookie, I mean, right out of the oven when those chocolate chips are still kind of, you know, a little bit soft. I mean, it's a great thing. It's a little bit crunchy. It's, it's, it's wonderful. But, you know, uh, what can really make a chocolate chip cookie better, I don't know if you've ever had this before, is if you take a little bit of salt or even a little bit of sea salt, you know, it's maybe a little bit coarse, and just sprinkle just a touch on top. And I'll tell you, it takes a cookie that's good and it makes it, well, even better. I remember it was probably seven or eight years ago we had a fellowship where someone brought these cookies that were just like that. I mean, they were just perfectly baked. They had the sea salt right on top. And for some reason, we didn't eat them all at the fellowship and they put them in the freezer. Well, there's a problem with that. Guess who's the only one in the building during the week? And it just so happened that they tasted delicious right out of the freezer, no de you know, you know, thawing required. And so here I am in the, you know, in the kitchen just eating these frozen cookies because they tasted so good and they were really amazing. And by the way, if you ever want to, no, I'm just going to make a request for some chocolate chip cookies, but I don't want to do that. Somebody might actually do that. But uh, it was, they were delicious. And we like those kind of complex flavors. You know, you can get hot chocolate that people will put spice in, cayenne pepper. You ever thought about that? That sounds kind of strange, but maybe just a little bit of touch will elevate something that maybe is a little bit one note and makes it complex and it makes it something that you'll remember more than just the run of the mill. You know, when I look at this issue tonight with the Word of God, we see something that's much different than something that's just one note. We see something that's complex. We see something that's memorable. We see something that is beyond what the norm would be. Could we put it that way? The Word of God. It's sweet. It's bitter. And that's what John had to go through as he ingested, as he took in this book. And so last week, just as a point of review, we saw, number one, if you're following along in your prayer bulletin, we saw, number one, the taking of the book. He, he had to take the book. That was important. Remember, we spent much time at the end of the message after we talked about the preliminaries from the first seven verses. Not that they're not important. They are important. But I wanted to focus on this book. And after talking about what those seven verses meant and exactly what was going on, we saw the need to take the book. And again, we don't know exactly what John's little book was, do we? It could have been that seven-sealed book that was presented in Revelation chapter number five. Uh, that, that could be what it was. Uh, it could be a pronouncement of that which was about to come. I think there's a compelling argument for that, certainly because there's some things that are going to be said in the future and even in the context of verse number 11 as well. I think there's a compelling argument for that. It could be his mandate. It could be his orders that he was to go out and to preach. And I think even in the context of verse number 11, we could make an argument for that as well. I don't know exactly what it was, but we did agree with this, is that whatever it was, it was the Word of God. It was the very words of God that were placed in this book. And while it may not have been these 66 books that we have in our hand here this evening, we can still draw some comparisons between the two when we look at the words of God that John was to take and the words of God that we have in front of us that the Lord wants us to take and the Lord wants us to read and that the Lord wants to make a difference in our life. So we started with that last week, and I want us to continue here at number two by looking at the tasting of the book. The tasting of the book. I don't know about you, but at first glance, the thought of John eating a book sounds a little strange. No, no, I mean, let's just be honest here tonight. I mean, we're reading the Bible, so sometimes we don't maybe, you know, oh yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense to me. He's eating a book. On the surface, it seems strange. I mean, maybe you eat books, you know, as on a regular basis. I don't know. Very fibrous. I don't know. Maybe that's what you're doing. But for the most part, I think we would say on the surface, the thought of John eating a book does seem a little bit outside of the norm. But I think there's a reason. Well, I know there's a reason that God has it there for us here tonight. 
But when we look at the issue of the Word of God, it should not be odd to us because God's Word in His Word, did you get that? God's Word in His Word is often compared to food. It's compared to milk, to meat, to bread, and to honey. And may I remind you uh, uh, that Jesus Christ himself is called the very bread of life. And so really, while the thought of ingesting a book may seem odd to us, when we see what the word says of itself, we come to the realization that there are many times comparisons are made about the word of God and food because just as food sustains us physically, the word of God is what sustains us Spiritually, remember, we've said this last week, we said it on Sunday morning a few weeks ago, that though the outward man perisheth, 2 Corinthians 4, the inward man is renewed day by day. Part of that process is by being in the Word of God. Your inward man is not going to be fulfilled by a Big Mac. They're tasty. I know nobody likes McDonald's, I know. Nobody likes McDonald's, but the line's always out to the street every time you pass one. Oh, now it's time for repentance. All right, here we go. No, no, but it's the, the Big Mac is not going to fill a T bone steak is not going to, hey, it's good. Hey, it's great. You know, green juice is not going to renew the inner man. Marsha just woke up. I'm sorry. Is this live? All right. But you know what will renew the inner man? The bread, Amen. the milk the meat of the Word of God. And just as much as we know we have to take of that physical food, we know that we must take of the spiritual food, but then you know what we do? We gotta taste it, which means what? We ingest it, we eat of it. You know what's interesting? If you were looking at Revelation chapter number 10 and you've read the Bible before, you might say, Pastor, this sounds kind of familiar. There's something about this text that actually seems like something I've read somewhere else. And if that's, where well, you're thinking tonight, you're absolutely right. Because actually two other occasions in the Word of God where there's a similar comparison that's made. And I want us to look at both of those tonight. So put your ribbon right there in Revelation chapter number 10. And then if you will, turn to Jeremiah chapter number 15. Do some exploring in the Word of God tonight. That's good. Jeremiah chapter number 15. Look at what it says in verse number 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Well, it seems here that when Jeremiah talks of eating the word of God, there's rejoicing, isn't there? But then it says in verse 17, I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand. For thou hast filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed? Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? It seems to me by looking at Jeremiah 15 verses 16 through 18, the word was ingested and there was sweetness, but there was also bitterness. The word was ingested and there was sweetness and then there was bitterness. But this isn't the only place that we see that. Turn over just a few pages to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter number 2. If you don't know where you're going, just keep going past Jeremiah, Lamentations. You'll be at Ezekiel chapter number 2. Look at verse number 9. Ezekiel 2, 9. I'll give you a chance to get there. By the way, let me say as you're doing that, if you're still new at going through the Bible and you're getting frustrated not being able to find some of these verses... Can I give you some encouragement? It gets better. But can I tell you how it gets better? By staying in the book. By staying in the book. It's interesting, you read the Bible long enough, and even if you read the same Bible long enough, there are times I can't remember a verse reference, but I've read through enough times that I can almost remember where it is on the page, and I can go back and find kind of where it is from a general idea. And so if you're not sure where certain books of the Bible are, if you're not sure if Job is really Job, or Malachi's Malachi. Look, I understand. But there's only one way to know, by staying in the book, which is kind of what we're talking about tonight. Ezekiel chapter number two, 
Verse number nine, by the way, it's Job and Malachi, just to make sure everyone's on the same page there. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Now continue on to verse number, or chapter three, verse number one. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. And again, to remind you, this roll is not talking about a roll of bread. It's talking about the scroll that was mentioned in the last chapter. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat, fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. And then I did eat it and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Well, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Now drop down to verse 14. It says this, so the spirit lifted me up and took me away and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. In these three passages, whether it's Revelation or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, we see that there is both sweetness and bitterness that is connected with God's word when we internalize it. I'm going to say that again. There's sweetness and bitterness that is connected with the process of internalizing God's word. Why is that? Well, it makes me think of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where it says, For the word of God is quick and it's powerful, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. A two-edged sword was able to be used for offense and for defense. It was able to parry, but it was also able to thrust. And in the same way, a two-edged sword is the kind uh, that's able to cut right to the heart. By the way, the Word of God, even today in 2023, cuts right to the heart of the issues of mankind. It's as relevant today as it ever was. I would argue that it's more relevant than the news that we see in the morning. It's more relevant than the newspaper that we had yesterday. It's more relevant than anything that you'll find on television television, that even though it doesn't mention things like the internet or television or cell phones or, or cigarettes uh, or any of those kind of things that we seem to have as modern inventions, that the Word of God applied in a modern world is just as relevant today as it's ever been. And with that relevance comes sweetness and bitterness. You say, what do you mean? Well, look, the Word of God is tremendously sweet. Isn't it sweet? Amen. I think it's Psalm 23, and I heard one preacher recently say, for some reason, it's the favorite of children and people who are about to die. Isn't that strange? Well, the kids love Psalm 23, and everybody wants to hear it by their bedside when they pass. But it seems like it gets lost a little bit in the middle sometimes. Although I think there's still a great appreciation for Psalm 23. But there are some times that when you're deep down, I mean like lower than a snake in the tire track, that you get to the point where you read one of the Psalms, it's pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. You know, it brings comfort in times of loss. How many times have been able to read from 1 Corinthians 15 when someone's lost a loved one, the hope to be able to see him again the hope to know of reuniting. We're going to get to the end of the book of Revelation. You want to talk about comfort. No more tears. No more pain. There's just times you just want to read that and soak up every detail. And it's sweet. It is so sweet. You know, it brings light in times of confusion. <clears throat> Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my trip path. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not in thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. You know, we almost say them, even as I'm reciting it, I'm almost saying them glibly, kind of like, oh, you know, we know this. You know, it's just the way that it is. But those are powerful promises. And they bring comfort. I've talked to several people recently about different things and They've said, well, I don't know what to do about this or that. And I've mentioned Proverbs chapter 3, but I also mentioned James 1, 5. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Can I tell you, if you could wear out a Bible verse, I would have wore out James 1, 5 a long time ago. 
because he's saying you can ask and you can ask and you can ask and he won't tell you all for asking. That's what it means, and upbraideth not. He won't get upset at you for asking. And by the way, he says he gives all men liberally. You want to be a liberal? That's the kind of liberal you ought to be. That's as far as I'll go with that. He gives to all men liberally, meaning this. You want wisdom? Lord, I need this much wisdom. He said, what did you say, this much? Here's the problem, we don't ask. Or when he gives it to us, we don't listen because it's not what we want. But I will say, generally, James 1.5 is incredibly sweet. When I don't know what to do, I ask him and he gives direction, that's pretty sweet. The promises of God, this time of year, we're constantly looking back to the Old Testament to see the promises of Jesus Christ that came to fruition in the New Testament. They say there's 365 promises in the Bible, one for every day of the year. That sounds good, but that's not true. Depending on how you reckon it, there's far more than 365 promises in the Word of God. Whatever the number is, and I've seen lots of them, there are way more than 365. And you can read those and get comfort that God is still on the throne. Amen. I mean, that's sweet. No, no I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be strange about it. I'm just saying it's sweet to know that you can read these things in a time of comfort and in a time of confusion and times needing encouragement and times you need direction that the word of God is sweet and it's sweet as honey. But there are times, there are times it goes down bitter. And it's interesting that it always says it tastes sweet, but then it goes down deep bitter. I don't know that I can tell you for sure the relevance of that other than to know this. There are times that the Word of God, when it tastes bitter, it goes way deep down to the soul. I'm going to tell you something that might surprise you tonight. You don't like being corrected. Thank you for understanding the irony, Joe. I appreciate that. You don't like being corrected. How dare you? See? None of us like being corrected. You know, there are times that I hear the preaching of the Word of God in church, and it's like, hey, that's good. I like that. That's exactly, that's what I need. That's, that, that's boy, I'm ready to go out for the day. I'm ready to go out this week, and I'm going to do something for the Lord. I listened to a message just last week. In fact, I wrote a letter to the pastor that, that, that preached it because it was such a blessing to me. I wrote him a little card to be able to tell him how much it, it meant to me. And I was listening to this message, and it started, and I said, in my mind, so-and-so needs to listen to this. I know no one here has ever done that. You know, hey, honey, you listen to the preacher? Boy, I hope that guy in front of me hears what he's talking about. At the beginning of the message, I thought, you know what? I should send this to this person, and they should hear this. And by the end, I realized the intended recipient got it. It was me. But you know what? That process is a little bit bitter. It hurts. It's a two-edged sword. It divides. It cuts. It, it's uncomfortable. Could I tell you this this evening? It's not my job to make you happy from the pulpit. There are things that I'm going to say sometimes that are going to run against your sensibilities. You know why? Because when I was in my study, there were so many of those things that ran against mine. Oh, you preach about pride. Well, guess who had to get the message before I preached it? it? Has to flow through the preacher. And I have to be able to have a process of humbling myself. And that process is a little bit bitter. It doesn't always feel good. We don't like being corrected. We don't like being told our way of thinking is wrong. People don't like hearing about judgment. You know, I was having this conversation with someone just last week. There's a reason a lot of churches don't talk about hellfire, or use the word sin. Do you know why? It's not pleasant. You don't make friends and influence people. But it's also not biblical preaching. Do I enjoy telling people that there's a real heaven and a real hell? Well, I sure enjoy the sweetness of the first part, but they need to know the bitterness of the second part. You know why? So that they can partake of the sweetness of the first part. To know that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Well, we see the lake of fire for all that it is at the end of the book of Revelation. To just open that up to us, just, just that glimpse. 
ought to give us some understanding that we need to reach as many people as we can because there's not much time. But, that's, but that goes down bitter. Did you like being told that you were going on a road to, towards hell? I don't think any of us said, hey, thanks for letting me know. I imagine most of us reacted pretty bitterly, if you will, towards it. But aren't you glad someone told you? Aren't you glad someone told you? See, the, the Word of God, it, it's sweet, but it's bitter. There's both sides to it. But this reminds us of how we must interact with this book when we take it in. You know, all that we saw here in Revelation, you, you can go ahead and just turn back there as I'm talking, but in Revelation chapter number 10, you, you find that, that what we learn about the sweetness and the bitterness helps us understand how we are to react to the Word of God when we read it, how we react to the Word of God when it's taught, how we react to the Word of God when it's preached. We have to learn to appreciate, for instance, preaching that's both sweet and bitter. Well, I mean, the pastor's just talking about sin. Well, because he has to. He has to. The problem is we enjoy preaching on sin as long as it's not ours. But someday, I'm going to step on your toes. And it's not because I was hunting for you. It's because the Word of God covers all the issues of life. And as we go through the Bible systematically, and as we go through these things, it's not me trying to hunt down different people and hunt down different issues, and I'm going to get this one and that one. No, it's just as we go through the Word of God, and as God leads in different directions, as we pray, as I pray for direction on what to preach and how to preach and when to preach, as we do so, it's going to hit all of us bitterly at some point or another. But we have to get to the point where we appreciate not just the sweet messages about heaven, and want the wonderful rejoicing about hearing about the gospel. If I preach Sunday morning, really with almost no application to the saved, all to, almost all to the unsaved, at least we should leave rejoicing saying, Jesus Christ did that for me. I mean, I never get tired of hearing about the gospel. Oh, it's another message about the gospel. It's another message about the gospel that we don't deserve. It's tremendous. But at the same time, we need that bitterness to grow. You know why? Because that those bitter words that tell us where we're wrong helps us identify places we need to repent and get right with God so that we can grow the way that we need to. We need the bitter. See, a lot of times people just look at, at the Bible as God's candy dish. No, no, this is what I mean. They're just, they're just picking out the sweets. And that sounds great until you realize you got to miss and skip over a whole lot of stuff that goes down bitter, but that's necessary. And can I tell you this? You don't really understand the sweetness without understanding the bitterness. You can't understand how sweet the sweet is until you've had something bitter. You ever had something that was super sweet? And then what do you say? Oh, I need something salty. Or I need something, you know what you need? You know, you don't, you don't drink, you know, a sugary drink and say, you know what I really could use? You know, I, I could really use a pack of Oreos right now. If you drink that sugary drink, you probably think, well, I need a contrast. I need something different. I, I, I need something else. And that's what the Word of God provides for us. It's not just that we pick out the sweets. It's not just that we pick out the stuff that we enjoy. It's not just that we pick out the stuff that makes us feel good. It's that we understand that even when the bitterness comes, and even when the bitter preaching comes, and even when we read something that, that goes against maybe our preconceived ideas or doctrines that we thought we had understanding of, that maybe we didn't have the understanding we thought of in the first place, and that we come to those places and it's a little bit bitter because we don't like being told that we're wrong by the pastor, by a teacher, or even worse, by the Holy Spirit. But can I tell you that once that bitterness is internalized, you can truly understand the sweetness for what it is. And we must come to appreciate being told where we're wrong because it brings the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's Hebrews chapter 12. You want the peaceable fruit of righteousness? You got to be corrected. And that peaceable fruit is sweet. It's really sweet. And I'm thankful for it. But you don't know how sweet it is till you've gone through the bitterness of the soul that comes with the Word of God's other edge. So what do we see? We see taking the book. We see tasting the book. And then number three, finally, we see telling the book. 
what it's saying, verse 10, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said to me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. He took it, he tasted it, and then what did God tell him? You gotta go back out and do more. There's more you gotta do. And whatever it was that he internalized, he then had to go out and give the message. And that's why I think very likely it is the message of what was going to take place in the second half of the tribulation, or it could be his mandate, his marching orders of what was to come. But he said this, once you take it in, once you taste it, here's what you got to do. You got to go out and you've got to give it. For us, the end result of taking in the word of God is for us to disseminate it. Meaning this, once we take it in, once we taste it, we got to do something with it. We got to make changes in our own life by confessing our sinfulness before the Lord. No, no. There are people who will hear the preaching of the Word of God. They'll hear the bitterness. They'll feel sorry and they'll walk out unchanged. They'll walk out just the same way. And maybe they feel sorry for themselves. Maybe they feel bad about themselves. But the Bible says that godly sorrow worketh repentance. And the point is not just to make you feel sorry and make you feel bad about yourself. Listen, when that bitterness comes, we want you to know that you come to the altar, you get it right and you can walk out with sweetness again because you got it right with the Lord and even better than that once you take it in you can give it to others once you take it in you can give it to others see there was more for John to prophesy after this how do I know that well there's a few more chapters after this we're not done until Revelation chapter 22 he had more work to do and whatever it was from God's word that he took in, it sustained him and he was able to propagate it. And guess what? We're still reading it. We're still being helped by it. Now, it was the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We understand that. But we are still being helped by what he took in and what he gave out even today. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Hey, pastor, that's a great message. I hear that sometimes on the way out, especially on Sunday mornings when I stand near the door and corner everyone on the way out. Um, I, I hear that sometimes, pastor, that's a great message. I'm thankful anytime says it. someone says it. I always say, well, praise the Lord, thank the Lord. And by the way, when I say that, that's not, oh, that's just something pastors have to say. No, I, I mean very literally, praise God. If you got something out of that, it's only God to be thanked because it came from Him. There's nothing new under the sun. No, no, thank God that you got something out of that. But even on my end, look, uh, look, necessity's laid upon me. In fact, if I don't do it, if I don't say, if I don't give out that which I've taken in, the Bible says, woe unto me. <laughs> Jeremiah's at the point where, where he's, he's so full of bitterness, he says, you know what, I just don't even want to talk anymore, I don't want to preach anymore. Every time I open my mouth, things, things get worse, I get persecuted. It's just not worth it. And the Bible says that there was a fire that was inside of him, and the fire was so great that he had to be able to give out the very words of God. And for you and I, the point of taking the book and tasting the book is that we have to tell other people about the book. And we have to tell other people about the message of the word of God. The logical conclusion of taking all of that is that they were to use it. See, our food does bring us enjoyment. Our food does tell us a little bit about maybe our decision-making process. But at the same time, in the end, our food is meant to be our fuel to drive us ahead. I mean, that's its main purpose. Now, God in His infinite wisdom and also to bring joy to us has given us taste buds. He's made a variety of delicious foods and a few that maybe we don't find so delicious. When I get to heaven, I have a few questions to him about raisins. Anyone else here tonight? All right, good. Yeah. I thought you'd be with me on that, Jamie. Oh, no, 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 he's okay. Well, anyway, moving on. I just felt that connection, Jamie. I thought you would have felt the same way. All right, well, I'll keep going. But uh, some God's given us these taste buds to be able to enjoy the food. But in the end, it's really just fuel. It really is, is literally just fuel for us to be able to be able to move ahead. 
why do we take in? You know, there are some Christians who sit at their desks like monks from the Middle Ages. They write and they take notes. They have volumes and volumes of notes, but they're no different. Their Bibles are marked up here, there, and everywhere. They know every Bible trivia question, but they have no real walk with God. They don't go to church, but they tell you all about what you need to do. They, 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 they don't follow the commandments of God, but they know the commandments of God. That was never the intention. The intent was to take, was to taste, but then to tell others about it and to make sure that we are right ourselves and that we tell other people about it at the same time. The end result is that the word of God, that sweet and that bitterness, if we take it in as we should, it's a meal that's so amazing that it puts us on a completely different path. No, no, this book is unlike any other book. This isn't like a classic of Mark Twain or Charles Dickens. This isn't something uh, that is even a work like Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, as amazing as that was and as scriptural as that was in so many ways. No, no, what we have here is the very word of God, and if we read it, and if we taste it, and if we allow it to, it will change our lives and the courses of other people's lives as well. It's a few years ago, we went to, my dad and I, when he was still living here, went to a, a restaurant right up the road. And, uh, you know, every few years, there's certain types of foods that seem to have a moment where everybody wants to cook them and everybody wants to buy them. And a few years ago, it was Brussels sprouts. Remember that? Well... I bet you like raisins. Anyway, but uh, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I had Brussels sprouts once when I was a kid, and the smell alone was enough to say, if I never touch them again the rest of my life, I'm good. I could lead a very fulfilled life and never have another one of these things ever. And so we went to this restaurant, and they were telling me the side dishes, and they said, we also have uh, Brussels sprouts. And I thought, that's... <laughs> This place isn't going to be open for long. Um, and so I asked them, I, I asked the lady, I said, what is your most popular side dish? She says, you're not going to believe it. It's the Brussels sprouts. I said, well, you're right. I don't. She goes, well, she goes, well you know, we, uh, we, uh, we char them. We cook them with bacon. I said, bacon? I was just intrigued enough to try it. I thought, all these people want it? And has bacon in it? I mean, I'll try it. Could I tell you that it was delicious? It had this kind of a, a little bit of a sweet glaze, and it was a little bit charred, a little bit of the bitterness that came from the Brussels sprouts. It didn't smell. That's a big one. And it had bacon. And it was good. And it was so good that I started telling people about how good the Brussels sprouts were. And I started telling people about the restaurant. You know why? Because I had a meal that was so unexpected. I had a meal that was so complex in its flavors. It, it, was, so, uh, it was so different than anything else I had that it was so good, I just had to tell somebody to go try it. And people would come to me and I said, they went there, I went there and the, I had the Brussels sprouts and I'd never had them before. And I like Brussels sprouts now. The problem with a lot of people is they look at their Bible like the Brussels sprouts. No, I'm talking about the first time when your mom boiled them and your house smelled like cabbage for a week. Could I tell you, the word of God is not one note. <laughs> It's complex. It'll take you a lifetime to be able to dig through its riches. And you'll find at the end of your life that you just started scratching the surface. There'll be times you're thinking you're doing pretty well and the word of God will step on your toes. There's times you think you're going the right direction and the preacher preaches and everything you're trying to do is to argue why he's wrong and you realize it's not him you're arguing against, it's God and his word. And you might even come forward. Imagine that, coming to the altar. 
and get that right with the Lord. And you walk out and realize the great sweetness. A sweetness that you hadn't had before or been a long time since you had. And you got the same sweet and bitterness all from the Word of God. But it doesn't happen if you don't take it. It doesn't happen if you don't taste it. And it doesn't happen if you really don't tell someone else. I'm, I'm going to give you this and, and we're done. You're taking something in tonight. Your soul is being fed by something. No, no, your soul will be fed by something. There's an old saying, garbage in, garbage out. You ever heard that? Garbage in, garbage out. You know, if your soul is being fed by the stream of worldly entertainment, it's not going to be able to truly understand this principle tonight. It can't. Why? Well, because the unsaved aren't going to learn about the Word of God from people who are constantly taking in something other than the sweet and the bitter book. Look, the unsaved shouldn't learn dirty jokes from Christians. The unsaved shouldn't see that the angriest person in their peer group is someone who calls Christ their Savior. The unsaved shouldn't see pettiness or jealousy or laziness from Christians or from their churches. No. Where does that come from? That comes from garbage in. That comes from feeding on the wrong sources. Worldly entertainment. Whether it's from the television, the movie, the music industry. Whether it comes from just a constant stream of, of doing what you want to do. Things that please you. Sometimes they're not even things that are wrong. They're just things that are out of proportion. Right. Hebrews 12 talks about that as well. That we need to lay aside not just the sin, but the weights that hold us back. And the weights would be things that are not sinful inherently, but they're inconvenient to running the race. But we're in taking all of those things and not really in the Word of God. Maybe for you, the Word of God, it's more of a spice than a meal. I think a lot of Christians are like that. You know, spice makes everything taste better. You know, that's why in our family, if it says one clove of garlic, it's, hey, <laughs> what, I mean, don't, don't you love life? I mean, we do more than one. Why not 10? You know, it makes it taste better. But I feel like a lot of people will sprinkle just enough of word of God in their life to make them feel good and then still go off and do whatever they want. That's not the Word of God being your necessary food. It's just being a little bit of spice to make you feel better about all your worldly decisions. That's not going to work. It won't. Feed on it. Embrace the sweet and the bitter. And the more you do, tell someone else about it. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.